I record this lecture. Mm. All right. Uh, oh, I have to first talk about because I put the brand and market elasticity. So there are two types of elasticity. So I'm continuing the previous lecture. Mm. There are, ah, oh, sorry. So I want to give you this example because I put this uh, problem in the homework, the last problem, market level elasticity and brand level elasticity. Yeah, sorry, I'm talking about the previous slides, the elasticity. All right, so it's a very simple concept. Okay, so let I, I give you an example. Uh, for example, think about the market of cigarettes okay, in Singapore. Okay, you count all the sales of the cigarette Okay. You estimate all the cigarettes of the uh, uh, the sales of the cigarette in Singapore, okay, and you can estimate the demand, right? And you you want to find the elasticity, okay? You want to know how your demand for a cigarette is uh, sensitive to the price change, okay? That's called market level, okay? You are looking at the whole market, the whole cigarette. But if you are interested in brand level elasticity, you can look at only specific uh, brand, the sales of the specific brand. For example, I only know Marlboro. <laughs> Is there any smoker here? No? Who? He's missing. Is he sick? <laughs> All right. So, yeah, smart, let's say you're interested in uh, demand of the smart board, all the smart board cigarettes. Okay. And you can think about the elasticity. So, think about the sensitivity of the sales of smart board okay, uh, in response to price change. Okay. If you are a manager of smart board and you want to increase revenue, what should you do? Okay. You can think about elasticity. Okay. And you can also think about market level elasticity. Do you have any opinion which one will be more sensitive to the price change? So let's say you increase the price. Okay. Do you think, hello? Oh, sorry. What's wrong with <laughs> Okay. We were talking about you. Are you a smoker? Yes. Were you smoking? That's why you're I right. wasn't smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, we were talking about market level, brand level elasticity. Okay, think about cigarette. Okay, the sales of the cigarette in Singapore, whole cigarette, and think about the elasticity, price elasticity of that. And also think about the Marlboro. What what brand do you like? Winston. Winston? No, no, Viceroy. Yes. Okay, so whatever. <laughs> So think about the elasticity of that brand, okay? The sales of the cigarette in that brand, okay? So which one do you think is more sensitive to price change? The whole market level elasticity of cigarette or for the Marlboro? Brand level. I think brand. It's brand level. Yeah. Because, what? Yeah. Yes, yeah. there are other substitutes, and to me, it looks like very similar to each other. Is it true? I mean, <laughs> the, the, the taste. Uh. If your brand uh, increased the uh, price by 50%, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to substitute, or you're not going to consume other brands? No, 50% would be too much. Yes. And what about the market level elasticity? Let's say uh, the price of, of the whole cigarette in Singapore it increased by 10%. Do you think because of that people will reduce the consumption a lot? No, because they are already addicted. Mm, yeah. okay. But in the brand, if you look at the brand level, um, yeah, if they are full substitutes, they are easy to move away from this brand to another brand. Okay? So maybe brand level can be more sensitive. Okay? So that's, uh, yeah, so in your homework you will see this. Market level is everything. Brand level is just looking at only, only that brand. Okay? 
But this have, I mean, you cannot always say that brand level elasticity is more sensitive. I mean, it all depends on the case. For example, I told you uh, about the Tesla model. They are doubling the price of this year sometimes. I mean, they are doing that because they know that their demand is very inelastic. There are customers who love Tesla. Right? So maybe that Tesla elasticity might be much less elastic than the whole market car market elasticity, okay? Yeah, so there is no right or wrong answer. It always depends on the situation, okay? All right. Okay, let's move on to, finally, uh, consumer preferences. Okay, so we are going to learn consumer behavior, their, how they make decisions. So we are going to build up a theory, okay? We have to start with preference, okay? So basically, our aim is to study how cons uh, consumers maximize their happiness subject to uh, their budget constraint, okay? So given your limited income, you want to purchase goods, okay? Consumption basket, okay? So in order to do that, you, in, order to, in order to make your decision on how much goods you are going to buy for each category. What do you have to know first? You have to know the preference, your own preference. If you don't know what you like, if you have zero idea of a preference, you cannot drive demand. You cannot do anything. You, you cannot maximize your, your happiness. For example, you guys don't know my, my preference, right? So you, can, you guys cannot make decision for me if I have $100 what I'm going to, what will make me the happiest because you guys don't know my preference. But you guys know your own preference. So that's why every day you're maximizing your happiness with a limited income, right? So yeah, so this is the key ingredient, knowing your own preference. So let's make it simple. Let's say you have only two goods. Okay. Okay. You can put any goods like uh, stupid like an orange and apple or coffee and other food, whatever you want. So so in here we are in this space, two dimensional space. Let's say we have two goods, good X and good Y. Okay. So in this space each point in the this two not dimensional space represent your consumption basket. Okay, how many goods of good X you are consuming, how many goods of good Y you are consuming. Okay, so preferences, you have to define your preference. Then you have to know which one you prefer for any given basket. Okay, so for example, any you pick any two baskets, A and B, and you can say your preference about this basket. You may say you prefer, you strictly prefer A to B. You can, you can define it like this. A strictly preferred B, or B strictly preferred to A, or you are indifferent between two baskets, which means that A and B give you the same happiness. Okay. Or you can also say like they weekly prefer to B, which means they, yeah, you, you, you're not sure, but you are, A is greater than or equal to B. Okay. Your happiness level for A is greater than or equal to happiness level for B. So assuming B. And you want to, so utility function is the mapping from two dimensional space to one dimensional space. Your life will become much easier when you can, when you can assign each of these two dimensional number. If you can represent each basket to one dimensional space. So you're with the utility function, utility function x, y. It, this maps from 
two dimensional number to one dimensional number. It's a function, the mapping between from two dimensional to one dimensional number. Because once you send it to one dimensional num number, you can compare everything. It, it, should, it gives you happiness level, how much happy you are by consuming each, each consumption basket in this space. Okay. So that's utility function. Okay. <clears throat> so for example, you can have utility function like this. You can have, it's, it's your choice. You can have, you have infinitely many options. Uh, utility function depending on your preference. <coughs> okay, so look, if you have this kind of function, these are sending the two dimensional number to the one dimensional num number, and it gives you the magnitude of your happiness for each consumption basket. Okay, but not all the functions can be uh, utility function preference. It has to uh, meet these three criteria, three assumptions, to call that some this function is utility function. To well to be well defined preferences, you need to have these three assumptions. Okay. So first, monotonicity. So everything is natural. Very basic assumptions. So first, monotonicity. Of course, you want to say that more is better. Okay, if you have a consumption basket that has more of the goods than the other consumption basket, the larger consumption basket has to give you higher happiness level. It's very natural. And number two, completeness. If you see any baskets, okay, if I give you, okay, basket A, basket B, whatever random basket, you have to know your preference, okay? You cannot say, oh, I don't know about this preference. I don't know what I prefer. So completeness is that you know your preference for any given basket, okay? And transitivity is also very natural. If you prefer A over B and B over C, then this means you prefer A over C. Okay, or you can also put the equality sign also. Or A, if you are indifferent between A and B, B and C, this means that A and C are the same. They give you the same, same happiness. Okay, so all these three things are very natural. All right. Now, this is a very important concept, indifference curve. It's a set of all the consumption baskets for which the consumer is indifferent. So it means that you can draw a curve okay, that connects all the baskets that give you exactly the same happiness level. For example, we can draw indifference curve like this. Good X and good Y. Okay. You can have, let's say this is your indifference curve. Okay. You see all the consumption baskets lying on this indifference curve. It means that everything, all these consumption baskets on this curve give you the utility level, the same utility level, for example, you bought. Okay, you can, yeah, you can draw a curve, always draw a curve that gives you the same happiness level. That's called indifference. Okay, super important concept. <clears throat> okay, so then how, what kind of curve can be indifference curve? So you look at the assumptions, okay. So monotonicity implies 
that anything that is more upper or northeast is preferred to uh, is, a, is strictly better um, so here you this is your basket and any basket here on this side look at the basket you see that the amount of the goods for good x and good y are strictly higher than the basket a if you pick any goods consumption basket here right okay so the monotonicity implies that any points that are more northeast have give you a higher utility level okay and also monotonicity implies that indifference curves have to have a negative slope what happens can you draw us indifference curve something like that what is the problem what assumption does this curve violate So you, this is wrong because so, look at this, look at this point. They, they are, this part is positive slope, right? So basket A, basket B, basket A has strictly more of good X and good Y, right? And this, if you draw them on the same curve, it means that they give you exactly the same happiness level. That violates monotonicity. If you choose a basket that is strictly more, okay, then it has to give you strictly higher happiness level. That's not the So you can never draw in different curve that has a portion of positive slope. It has to be always going down, going down. value there's two x value yeah it's okay i mean so you mean this yeah so why is the same two x value that has yeah yeah this also violates monotonicity because you yeah good y the amount is the same but good x Basket B, basket B has strictly more of good X. So it, you have to assign strictly higher happiness level. So it is violent. So if you have any portion that is positive slope, it's wrong, okay? And indifference curves are not thick. It's a bit stupid comment, but so you cannot. I mean, I mean, if if some a child wants to draw indifference curve like this, okay, this is all this area is the indifference curve. I mean, it's not a curve. <laughs> what is so that violates monotonicity because you can always find up two two baskets inside that is strictly better than the other one. Can, you can for example if you find if you can find always two baskets that is strictly more than the other. So transitivity. So and all this assumption tell you that 
Indifference curves cannot cross with each other. That's wrong. When you draw indifference curves, never ever make them cross. Okay. Of course, if the two indifference curves coming from me and from the other person, yeah, then they can cross. They are independent. But if it's coming from one person, one preference, it can never cross. It, this violates every, every single assumption. For example, look at, the, look at the point C. So this violates the completeness. This violates that this function is not well defined because you, uh, basket C lies on the two different indifference curves. Right? Which means that basket C can be can is assigned to two different utility level. I C one, I C two. They give you different, strictly different level of utility. So that this uh, <coughs> violates the completeness, but also this violates monotonicity. It violates everything. <laughs> okay. So, or you, you can think about this. So it says by transitivity, B is the same as C, and C is same as A. Then you have to have B is the is same as A, but it's not possible. B is more on the northeast than A, right? So it's, it's a contradiction. So never ever make your indifference curves to cross with each other. So usually how is the how do you draw indifference curve? You draw indifference curve like this, for example. So as you go your indifference curve move to northeast, it Okay. It gives you higher happiness level because they have more of the good. Question? Oh, I thought that's not possible. I thought like one percent only one. Uh, uh, yeah. So when you change your indifference curve, it means that your utility level goes up. You have different utility level. Every time I change, it goes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you change your utility level higher, so this this all the baskets here, it will give you a strictly higher happiness level than this basket here. So for each utility level, you can draw a specific indifference curve. Sing this. All right. So, do you remember the concept of the partial derivative? Okay. So, try to refresh your memory from the calculus. The utility function has two variables because we assume two goods in this textbook. Okay, x and good, x and good y. M nu x is partial derivative of the utility function with respect to x. Okay. And m nu y, partial derivative with respect to y. Okay. So partial derivative m nu x, partial, oh sorry, partial u, partial x.
This means that you take derivative with respect to x while fixing y as constant. Okay. So, what is the meaning of this m nu x? How will you interpret m nu x? Yes, very good. Yeah, m nu x is how much additional utility you will get when you increase just a little bit of x okay, while fixing y. Okay. So whenever economists put this word marginal, whenever you see marginal utility, marginal something, it means that it involves the concept of derivative. Okay. I want to refresh your memory from calculus. So in calculus, you have y, okay, and let's say you have this function y equals fx, and x. Let's say y equals fx have this kind of curve, okay. And what is the, let's say you are interested in x0. What is this f prime x0? What is f prime x0? If you take derivative of function f at x0, what does it imply? Yes. It's a slope at x0. Uh, sorry, I signed up for this SMU entrepreneurship. Is it really? <laughs> uh, what is that? It's not Okay, so F, you know that f prime x0 is the slope of this curve at x0. Okay. I mean, in your calculus class, you learned this. Uh, oops. So let's say your x is very far from x0, okay? So you are interested in the rate of change, okay? Here, your, here is your x. This is delta x, okay? When you move delta x this much, your y moves by delta y, right? So rate of change here is delta y over delta x, which is the slope of this straight line, right? Delta y over delta x, okay? So what is the derivative? Derivative means delta y over delta x, but when you move your x very close to x0, this is equal to f prime x0, okay? It's the slope, which is rate of change, okay, delta y over delta x, when you move your x very, very close to x0. So economists say it's marginal when you move something very close to something and you are interested in the rate of change, you call it margin. What is, what is your marginal change? So whenever you look at this marginal, it's always derivative. Remember, it's the concept of derivative. Okay. So we call it, so if you do that, if you send your x to x0, you calculate this slope, then you will, your slope will approach this tangent line, the slope of this tangent of this curve. Right? That's what you learned in, in calculus. That's the concept of derivative. Okay. So, so the concept of derivative is the instant rate of change. Okay. When the x is very close to some, some point x0. Okay. So mu x, mu y, partial derivatives are the similar concept. You just fix 
one variable and then you take derivative with respect to only one variable x or y okay so actually it's more proper let's say you are interested in instant rate of change at x0 y0 then it's partial u x0 y0 dx okay you are interested in the instant rate of change at this point x0 y0 how your utility change what is the rate of your utility change when your x is close to x0 okay So additional happiness that you get by consuming one more of good x or one more of good y by in terms of ratio. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, it's it. I don't know why it gives an error. Okay. Can you do this, A, B, C? Calculate the marginal utilities and answer part B and C. You know how to take derivative. <laughs> 
I have taken calculus class. Okay. Okay, you can calculate the partial derivatives of good with respect to x and y. Okay. And when your derivatives are positive, so x and y are the the consumption. Okay, it, which will be always positive or non-negative. Okay. If if you assume that x y are strictly positive, okay, these derivatives are all strictly positive, which means that your utility, it's it's basically more is better, the monotonicity, it's increasing. Your utility level increases, okay. When you have more of good x, more of good y. And the derivatives are positive. It means that it's your utility is increasing, okay? And actually, you just look at this utility, root x and two root y, root x plus two root y. If you have more of good x, good y, of course, you have higher utility level. Okay. Are the marginal utility so which good? What happens if x and y increase? What happens with your mu x and mu y? These are all in the denominator, so they are decreasing. So they have decreasing marginal utility, which is very natural. Okay. If you increase, if you keep consuming more of good x, uh, for example, assume that good x is pizza, good y is Coca Cola. Okay. Your consumption on the cola is fixed, but you keep consuming more of pizza. And think about additional happiness that you get by consuming each additional pizza, which is that marginal utility. Okay, what happens to your marginal, ut marginal utility? It decreases because, yeah, first you are hungry, the first slice of pizza, you're, when you are eating, it's, you're super happy. And then second, yeah, you're still happy, but less happy. For the third slice of pizza, fourth, fifth, fifth slice of pizza, you're already full. So you're less happy. That means your additional happiness by consuming fifth pizza is much lower than your additional happiness from the first slice of pizza. Right? So basically, you get bored as you consume more and more of one good, so so your marginal utility decreases. You have decreasing marginal utility, which is natural. Okay. Ugh. Okay. Now. Let's take the ratio between this marginal utility, m nu x over m nu y. So you know what is m nu x, what is the interpretation of m nu x, m nu y, but what happens if you take the ratio?
So I have to see if you take the ratio. What, what is the new interpretation? Okay, keep thinking. Additional happiness from the X divided by additional happiness from the one. This is very important because the marginal rate of substitution. You're gonna keep seeing this. And I want you to know, I want you to have a clear concept with this. So let me give you an example. Oh. Oops. Okay, let's assume that good X is pizza, good Y is cola. Okay. And assume that you just consumed one slice of pizza and two cans of cola. So you are at the point x is 1, y is 2. Okay. So at this point, you want to know what is, what, what is your MRS, marginal rate of substitution. Okay. So you are interested in getting your MRS at this point. Again, mar you see marginal rate of substitution. It's a rate of substitution between the two goods, two baskets, but it's, it says marginal. Okay, so what does it mean? Whenever you bring the, this, you, whenever you see this word marginal, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are interested in the rate of substitution, very close to, to this basket, okay? You take any basket that is extremely close to this basket, one, two, and you want to calculate the rate of substitution. Okay. Anyway, so this is equal to m nu x at this point, one, two. m nu y at this point, one, two. Let's assume that your, what is m nu x, one, two? It is your additional happiness level when I give you one more pizza. So let's say your additional happiness level when I give you one more pizza is 10. And you already consumed two cans of cola. So let's say your additional happiness when you consume one more cola. If I give you one more cola, given that you already drank two cans, it's lower, uh, five, your, that's your additional happiness. By consuming one can of cola. So you compare these two, you take the ratio, you get this number, two. That's your marginal rate of substitution when you have consumed one pizza and two colas. Now I want you to discuss with your, in your group about the interpretation of this value two. What does this two represent? How would you like to interpret this situation of this value two?
Okay, anybody? Your group. Yeah. I think like we think that it's like it means that you're willing to sacrifice two cold colas for one pizza and you still you're still as happy as before. Yes, very, very good. Okay, cool. Yeah, you can talk about many other interpretations. What about you? You guys? Uh, how would you like to say? Uh, how much is like at that point right if you want to increase our consumption and stay in the same utility, we can either eat two more pizza or eat one or drink one more cola. Okay, so that will give you the same additional yeah. happiness, right? All right, what about you? Uh, as long as the number is more than one, you keep consuming eggs until the number hits one where consuming either one will give you the same satisfaction. So... Can you? Yeah. Can sorry. Can you say? Uh, because as long as the numerator bigger than the denominator, right? Then you'll keep consuming x. Cause you'll definitely bring you more. Keep consuming x until when? Until it becomes one over one. Like both give you the same amount of satisfaction. Okay. So how would you interpret the number two value two? What does it mean? It means that. Consuming one more pizza will make me two times happier than consuming two more cola. Yes. I mean, consuming one more pizza gives you the same happiness, additional happiness level of consuming two additional cola, right? Yeah. There. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. So basically, MUX ten means that I already consumed one pizza and two cans of cola. And at this point, if you give me one more slice of pizza, my additional happiness is 10. My happiness level is twice higher than my additional happiness when you give me one more cola. Okay, so you compare this additional happiness for one more pizza and one more cola. Okay, so the, the, the ratio is 2. It means that you give me two colas or you give me one cola. Uh, one one pizza 
I will have exactly the same additional happiness. Okay, so which means that look at this, it's marginal rate of substitution. Why do you why do you think they call it rate of substitution? So one pizza, two colas, substitute you can substitute. That gives you the same happiness level. So rate of substitution is two. Two over one. Yeah. The rate of substitution is that one pizza equals two colas. You are, in other words, you are willing to give up two colas to get one more pizza, and that gives you exactly the same happiness level. You are on the same indifference curve. Or vice versa. You are willing to give up one pizza to get two colas, okay? And still, your happiness level does not change. So when you talk about rate of substitution, you have to talk about this combination of the goods that give you that make you stay at the exactly same happiness level. And you are indifferent between this this substitution. All right. Okay. Let's let me give you more intuition about the marginal rate of substitution. So read the third statement. MRS is equal to the negative of the slope of an indifference curve. Do you have any idea why this is true? So basically it says It says MRS, you calculate MRS at any given point, then it says it is equal to, so equal to negative of the slope of the indifference curve at that point. For example, MRS at this specific point x0, y0, Slope of indifference curve at x0, y0. Do you have in, any intuition? So let me draw, for example, let's say this is your indifference curve. Okay. You calculate MRS here. Okay. You can calculate MRS by M nu X over M nu Y. And you think about the slope at this point X0, Y0. So you calculate you think about MRS, x0, y0, which is m nu x over m nu y. And then you think about slope here, slope of this indifference curve. Why these two, why do you think they have to be the same? I mean, yeah, slope is always negative number. So you, that's why you put negative sign here to make it equalize. Why do you think the slope is equal to MRS? Why their magnitude are exactly the same? Do you have any intuition? Yes? Is it because the formula, the top is a differentiated x and below is differentiated y? Yeah. So, but then that one is, the slope is the differentiated of the curve at that point. Uh -huh. So it's equal to the same. 
All right, very good. You have some intuition. What about others? Yes? Yeah? Okay, you also have some intuition. Okay, very good, thank you. What about others? Do you have some, some sense? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's yeah. I'm going to give also mathematical proof why they are exactly equal. Okay. You need a total differentiation. Okay. But I just wanted to see whether you have some intuition. But you guys are good. All right. So let me give you more concrete intuition. So number one, intuition. Intuition of why why MRS is equal to the slope of the indifference curve. Okay. MRS is the rate instant uh, margin rate of substitution between good X and good Y. So okay. So let's assume that this is uh, you are. Uh, You are here. Let's say you are at the basket A. Okay. So let's start with the rate of substitution, not marginal, rate of substitution. So whenever you talk about substitution, all the baskets, the comparison basket has have to lie on the same indifference curve. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. So let's say your basket B lies here. Okay, what is your rate of substitution? It will be the straight line, the slope of this. So it, which means that your happiness level doesn't change when you exchange between these two, delta x to gain more of delta y. The slope of this straight line, the, the blue line, is the rate of substitution between b and a is delta y over delta x that's that's rate of substitution rate of substitution okay then what is the marginal rate of substitution this is not marginal because basket b is too far away from basket a when you want to talk about marginal they have to be very close by. That's the concept of derivative. So let's move your B a bit more closer. Now your B is here. Now another rate of substitution will be the slope of this. dy, dy, the new dy and new dx. So your slope, as you move your B very close to A, so you first it's here, here, and you keep bringing B down, 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 very close to A. Now you can call it marginal rate of substitution if B is very close to A. And look at the slope. What happens to the slope as you move B 
down very close to A. Can you see? Can you see the change of the slope? The slope becomes flatter, flatter, flatter. If when your B is here, it's even more flatter like this. And then eventually, when your B is extremely close to A, what happens? What is the slope? The instant rate of change between B and A? Yeah, it will be the slope at point A, right? The slope. So that's the intuition. So eventually, this tangent line that is that is tangent to basket A, this this slope will be the rate of substitution when the basket B is very close to A. That's called the marginal rate of substitution. With the slope is exactly the slope of the indifference curve at basket A. And it's this is same as marginal rate of substitution. Okay, that's an intuition. Now I want to give you a mathematical proof. Do you remember have you learned total differentiation in calculus? You have have you taken multivariate calculus? Yeah. So if you forgot, please go back to your calculus textbook and study multivariate calculus. Okay? So if you study that again, you will see what is total differentiation, okay? So I'm going to use that. So have you heard about chain rule? You know what is chain rule? Yeah, the total differentiation is very similar to chain rule. You use chain rule to do that. All right, now let's do the mathematical proof. is that I want to let you know that the indifference curve oh it's very that gives an error anyway x well, let me use another application Assume that uh, you are interested in point x0, y0. Okay. And let's assume that this consumption basket lies on this indifference curve. Okay, this indifference curve. 
okay you can if you know your tilt function you can also find the function for your indifference curve okay you can represent your indifference curve function in terms of y equals fx for example let's assume that your you your utility is uxy uxy equals x times y okay for example so i'm going to show you how you can get you can have this indifference curve function expressed for y equals fx okay how can you find this example if your utility is x times y and let's say you are you want to get the function for i indifference curve when utility level is 10. so you're indifferent you are you are interested in the indifference curve when your utility level is 10. what is your y equals fx what is your in this case how can you express your function for indifference curve for all the baskets that give you the happiness level at 10. yes y equals 10 over x and this is your fx y equals fx which represents exactly this indifference curve that give you happiness level at 10. okay so this is your intuition and you can <clears throat> so on the indifference curve in the indifference curve okay you can represent your x y okay on the indifference curve your y is fx okay you can actually represent your u utility function as one variable function x f x right if you are on the indifference curve okay so with this example if u x y is x times y your your u becomes just one variable function which is x times y is fx x times fx x times y which is equal to x times 10 over x so if you are on the if we are on the indifference curve okay and you want to represent the utility level okay you want to use the utility function x times y you substitute y equal to your indifference curve function fx then it becomes x times 10 over x it's one variable function of course x will be cancel of course because your utility level on your indifference curve will always give you utility level 10. but anyway you see that you can represent your utility function in terms of one variable function if you are on the indifference curve okay, so and here my question is what is your delta u when you change your x variable from 0 to 10 whatever 0 to 20 whatever but you are moving on the indifference curve x fx okay i just play on the indifference curve you move points in your percentage basket on the indifference curve what is your delta u what is change in u zero yeah your utility level doesn't change because you're on the indifference Okay, so we are going to use that to prove this this thing. Okay. So
Okay, so I'm gonna draw the indifference curve again. So let's take your indifference curve. This, let's say somehow you know the indifference curve. Okay, you can represent that function as fx. Okay, so this is the indifference curve. Okay. So you are moving on the indifference curve and let's so your your delta u on indifference curve is zero. Your u when when I when you change your basket on this indifference curve, your delta u is zero. Okay. All right. Now, your delta u can be expressed as one variable function, du, one variable function, which is x and x, y. Y can, y is fx, because we assume that you are on the indifference curve. du, dx, which is exactly exactly this thing delta u on indifference curve is equal to, you can express in mathematically by du dx right and you put y equals fx here because you are on the indifference curve if you look x comma fx that is your indifference curve right so you change x on the indifference curve your delta u is zero because you're on the indifference curve. Okay. Now you use the total differentiation. Okay. Uh, by total differentiation. Total differentiation, or or it's similar to chain rule. So your du dx, your one variable. You use d du dx when it is one variable function. If it's multivariate function, you use partial. Okay du x okay and i'm gonna so this means exactly sorry this means exactly delta u on ic okay which is zero okay okay du dx by total differentiation this is pars first you take derivative with respect to the first variable partial u x now it becomes just y because now you are treating your utility function as two variable function x and y okay the partial u partial x and then you do the channel okay dx dx plus partial u and then now you take derivative with respect to y, partial y, and then you do the chain rule, no? dy, dx. This is total differentiation. If you forgot, revisit your calculus. <coughs> All right. You know that this whole thing is zero. Okay. Partial u partial x is m u x, right? Oops. 
So m u x you can rewrite it and dx over dx is one plus m u y dy dx equals zero. Okay. By the way, dy dx when y is the indifference curve, y equals f x. Okay. All right. So if you rearrange the term, then what happened? m u x over m u i is equal to minus dy dx so y equals fx is the indifference curve so basically you proved your mrs by using total differentiation mrs xy is equal to the negative negative of the slope of indifference curve